Yeah, I'm just going to show them. Okay, well, while um, Teresa's getting all that ready, um, uh, obviously, you know, uh, Teresa's going to be one of our um, experts in one of the next sessions. But um, yeah, so Teresa's from the University of Warwick. And um, yeah, last but not least, here we go. All the best. Thanks very much. I'm going to give you a brief wave and then turn my camera off because I'm very much aware that my slides um, are quite small. And I really want you to be able to uh, see them as, as well as you can. But having said that, I've also put them on SlideShare. I'm an open education practitioner, so I very much believe in putting stuff out there. So I'll pop that link into the chat for those who um, would prefer not to have to squint at slides. Um, so uh, as with the first presenter, I've chosen three examples of my work over the years. I've been working with Mahara for um, quite some years now, probably near enough 10 years. Um, and during that journey, I've, I've used Mahara in lots of different ways. Um, and as I approach retirement now, I'm thinking, well, it's really important that I capture some of the reasons why I use it and also some of my thinking behind how I use it. So I'm really welcomed um, some suggestion that we could have this online um, session today. I'm really enjoying it. So thanks all very much for sorting out the Mahui. Um, so I'm thinking particularly from a, uh, a skills pr um, perspective. I'm a language teacher by trade, but I'm not just thinking about language skills here. Um, and you'll see in the example um, uh, the range of uh, skills that I'm particularly thinking about. And I'm going to start off with a very quick screenshot from um, one of the pieces of work I've done over those last 10 years around ePortfolio for assessment. So big shout out to Lisa for her work on the um, assessed ePortfolio ebook, uh, which came out recently and is shared on our pages here. And uh, this really was a journey for me. This was a project whereby we looked at including recognition for our language learning students who come from diverse backgrounds and different um, course requirements and different disciplines um, to try and take account of the skills that they acquired besides their language learning skills whilst they were part of a language module. Um, so over the past um, years, we have run for about 100 to 150 students studying everything from uh, they may be doing a, a beginner's course in Chinese. They may be doing um, an advanced French course. Um, and they're doing this as an addition to their main uh, degree. Uh, and what we were really looking for is a way of making them appreciate and acknowledge their skills growth. So we managed to put together a program collaboratively with a group of tutors, um, which would be assessed through ePortfolio and contribute 20% of their mark. Um, and during this, or as, as part of this um, activity, what they would have to do would be to reflect upon their language learning journey. Um, and we would typically have um, a couple of face-to-face -face sessions with them, um, usually in the first term and the second term, but most of the um, input really was uh, on a as needed basis. So a YouTube channel and of course the Mahara collection. Um, so this is just a, a screenshot of a Mahara collection that we use. Um, one of the first things we try and explain to students is that they're going to have to use this tool in order to reflect on their journey. But we also explain to them that, that Mahara, unlike Moodle, um, is a space that belongs to them and that when they manage and create pages and collections for themselves and we encourage them to just do that for fun at first and just play and see what Mahara can do, um, they, they find themselves in uh, a safe space where they can experiment, but also where they can collect examples of their learning, and their language learning um, over the year and put together into an assessed ePortfolio. And as you can see there, there's a, a student guide that they can download. So we give them this example of resources that they need to get into fairly quickly in order to understand how best to make use of 
Mahara, which is branded by Warwick as my portfolio. Um, so th this collects together lots and lots of different uh, multimedia examples of the sorts of things that they can share and we encourage them to get creative and to enjoy it. Um, the most important thing, I think, uh, the most important lesson I think that we learned from this is that if you're going to insist on reflective practice, you need to get students into um, a mindset of expecting to go to a place to reflect and to capture their reflections. And we also had to break that connection in their minds between um, reflecting positive things must be a good thing if you're going to be assessed. We very much dispel that right at the beginning and say any reflection on any of your experiences, good or bad, are important. Anything that has become a learning moment for you or a moment that has mattered, capture it. Even if you keep it in your journal and you never ever share it in your final um, e assessed e-portfolio, that's fine. It's just giving you a space. Um, and in order to help students feel comfortable in that space, we make sure that they are members of a shared group on Mahara right at the beginning and that they access the forums and the uh, interaction through that shape. So we try and get them as familiar with the space as possible uh, right at the beginning. So that's the assessed ePortfolio project. Uh, and as I say, I've written about it many times um, elsewhere. I'll just pass on uh, one quick link in the chat uh, to a post that I did uh, on um, the Alt C blog about it. So if you haven't um, read about it, but it is, as I say, also um, in the ebook that Lisa created. So I'm going to move on to my second example, and this is more lengthy and more recent. Um, so three years ago, I designed and implemented uh, a module specifically for the School of Modern Languages and Cultures final year students. Um, and Erasmus students who join us. And this is very much focused on learning design for language learning, um, and particularly the use of digital spaces. So the cohort are generally final year language degree students who may have spent a year abroad. Uh, they generally have, and many of them have already done a little bit of teaching, even if it's just one-to-one -one coaching um, as part of their uh, sort of income <laughs> Uh, earning activities um, outside of, stu outside of uh, student life. Um, the focus is very much on language pedagogy and on learning design, um, but incorporated within this more recently, we've included uh, the work that, that I do on virtual exchange. So virtual exchange is um, a collaboratively designed uh, set of task-based learning opportunities where students connect with uh, speakers of other languages in their other countries in order eventually to co-create an artifact. But we work towards that process. Um, so we start with sort of simple information share and we build up to group work and um, more, more demanding use of technologies because this is all done at a distance. So the assessment of this particular module is 100% e-portfolio. It includes the classic 1,500 word essay, so a short essay, and it includes the need to um, create a learning interve intervention and explain the rationale. Um, it also encourages, as I say, students to explore other digital spaces. And the starting point for that, for me, is moving them from the Moodle into the Mahara and getting them to critically reflect on the differences uh, behind the philosophies of these two spaces. Um, we make lots and lots of very concrete um, parallels between moving in and out of different physical spaces and moving in and out of different digital spaces and their effects on us individually. So, you know, we do quite a lot of furniture shifting within my teaching room here to give them the idea, you know, how does it feel to sit in this group or in this layout? And now let's think about it in the digital. How does it feel to be in this space and know who can see what you're doing and 
what, you, what permissions you have and what you can uh, do with those spaces. And we're also encouraging here the reflective habit. So I ask my students every week, we have a practical session um, every other week, and we have a theoretical session in the weeks in between. I ask them to use the um, Mahara journal to reflect on uh, their experience of teaching and being taught and to reflect on the experiences or the focus of whatever that week has been. Um, the criteria for assessment I'll share with you now as well so you can get a, a, an idea for those of you who are interested in, in such things um, of how this sort of activity is, um, is assessed. So the reason I've taken this particular slide, and I have got Joe's permission to do this, uh, and a few screenshots from his ePortfolio, is that um, what Joe did was quite unusual and uh, particularly stood out to me. Um, essentially, most of most students, and um, I, I think we should put ourselves all in this box, most of us do the things that are at the top of the to-do list first, don't we? We do the things that matter first and then we work our way through the other things. Um, so in terms of the criteria for assessment, there were certain things that had to be submitted through an e-portfolio. But around that criteria, it also says, you know, if, if you have captured things through your use of Mahara that you wish to share, um, that help contextualize your journey and your experiences, then you can do. And Joe really embraced this, and I was absolutely over the moon when I saw his, his work here. It was very clear that he went into this identifying into this particular module, which is only a 15 cap module, it's, uh, it's quite short, it's just a, um, a single term of teaching. Um, with his own ideas of what he wanted to gain from the module. And you can see here he's identified what he wanted to find out from the course. And I think that was really crucial. Whether that was there right at the beginning or whether that occurred to him later, I don't know, but this is what he told me. Um, and he particularly zoned in on some of the uh, work that we'd looked at from theoretical perspectives in terms of scaffolding. Um, and we look at, as well at theories of uh, obviously learning theories and things that are important for them uh, envisaging what teaching will be like for them. So he produced his own little visual here, which he shared. Um, and we looked at the visitors and residents theory and compared it to Prensky as well. And he's obviously been quite struck with this because he's taken what, what really sort of um, impressed me was that he's taken this to a very personal level. He thinks he started to think about how he used um, technology, not just as a quick fix in order to learn vocabulary, but how resident he was in it um, and what could happen if he were more resident. Um, and, uh, you know, what therefore possibly could happen if he encouraged students to be more resident and how would he do that? So he really got to the heart of thinking about what it is to be a digital uh, um, teacher. And uh, his final reflections on whether he met his objectives, well, I've just taken uh, that first one out because it's particularly relevant. Um, and what I really liked is you know one of the most uncomfortable things I always find as a as a language teacher in particular is and especially as a, 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 a let's say mature language teacher <laughs> let's put it that way um, is that uh, you know I find myself in in position of being a sort of technology evangelist um, with young people who sort of think you're a bit of a uh, you know it's, it's, aren't you a bit old for all of this um, and what was really nice was that he. Uh, started to um, reflect more deeply on the use of technology and saw that it actually it was it, the choices that we'd made in the module um, had actually enhanced his learning because he'd engaged with them. It's very easy often, I mean, again, we all do it. it we, we say students do it, but, you know, I put myself in their position and I think, yes, I would probably do the same. Um, we tend to think, okay, what can I achieve with the minimum effort? Um, he had put himself in the position of, well, you know, I think I'll try that and, and then I'll reflect on it. 
Um, and although I might not always agree with the, the outcomes of those reflections, what I could see from him was that he was paving the way to becoming a reflective practitioner. And as I say, after a sort of 30 odd years in the profession, if there's one thing that I value more than anything, it is the opportunity to reflect on what you do. I think it's probably the most important thing um, that any of us do uh, in order to, uh, you know, really develop. Uh, so I think that would really stand him well. Uh, and I, I love the fact here that he says this has been an eye opening process. Um, Really, I really did see through Joe's work here uh, that he had thoroughly engaged with the processes uh, and, and not been too worried about um, just, just delving into the theoretical. I haven't actually linked to his uh, fully portfolio, but I can describe it briefly to you. It was multimodal. I've obviously grabbed screenshots of his reflection because I wanted to draw your attention to the nature of that reflection. Um, but he had recorded some little audio and, and video presentations of himself reflecting as well, short, uh, short snippets. And he'd included some videos and material that he'd found and res referred to uh, resources that I'd shared um, and annotated them. So it was a truly multimodal um, e-portfolio, exactly, Philippa. And, and that was vital to me because actually as communication professionals, um, as we're seeing through COVID, and perhaps we're seeing this in more disciplines than just languages, I'm sure, um, actually a lot, of our, a lot of our communication is these days mediated through communication uh, technologies of some sort. And we need to understand how that works. And I think we've seen some wonderful examples. I'm not going to um, go into detail, but I think we've seen some wonderful examples of people discovering for themselves what is communicated through a Zoom meeting um, based upon what is behind you in your bookshelf or what you're actually wearing below screen level, um, people perhaps have started to get a, a little bit more of an insight into uh, the vagaries and the importance of understanding our digital identities and uh, the complexities of multimodal um, communication. So my final um, uh, example for you actually is much more to do with my next um, professional journey, which is moving towards retirement, because a lot of my reflection and development has happened through Mahara. Um, most of that in recent years has been a central um, implementation of Mahara. Uh, and I started to realize that a lot of the work that I've done, such as this for the Warwick International Higher Education Academy, um, which was a project around um, open education, um, was sort of going to be closed and lost into uh, an institutional environment. Uh, so what I did was went and off and investigated, as I had encouraged students in the past to do, um, some of the free uh, spaces that are available for hosting. And Folio Spaces is the one that I chose. Uh, some of my students previously have, have um, also removed their stuff and taken it with them. I love the fact that, that Mahara uh, work is, is uh, portable and the fact that our little uh, learning journeys as they happen in an institution don't then get lost to that institution and actually a part of our lifelong learning journey. Um, so I've moved these out into um, folio spaces, uh, moving beyond institutional spaces, being the fact that that's portable and crossing um, boundaries um, is particularly important to me as an open educator. But also important, I think, increasingly to students, because um, if you acquire learning through particular setups and then you lose access to that learning, how do you demonstrate it um, perhaps to a future um, audience or perhaps to a future employer. Um, and even given the sort of crisis that we've been faced with recently, um, you know, what space are you giving students to actually uh, take things away with them um, uh, more creatively? Um, so I was very happy with the move to Folio Spaces. I'm find, finding that uh, very useful. In fact, I've even invested in a, a small um, annual um, fee. I mean, we're talking small 
<laughs> we're talking under 10 pounds a year um so you know a, a little bit of a space where i can continue my mahara journey and uh, continue to make use uh, of the very many useful functions that it has and if i move on to then the next slide this might be an unexpected slide perhaps i'll, I'll give you a minute to, to just read that and digest it but this is increasingly a focus of my work when i think about um, teaching and learning through technology and computer mediated technologies it's it's very much about the importance of accessibility the importance of uh, not just accessibility in in terms of uh, disability which of course is important and absolutely should be there but accessibility in terms of um, cost in terms of resources um, in, in terms of equity uh, so I think it's really really important that we provide uh, spaces and that we very deeply about how our choices in terms of technology can actually increase inequalities and that as to me as a as a, a, a long time educator um, is abhorrent i'm involved in teaching because i want to increase equality and i want to address some of the um, challenges that many of our young people uh, and indeed all of us face on a day-to-day -day basis um, so this importance of focusing and, and developing uh, reflective practice amongst teachers and learners and including in that a notion of criticality um, critical digital literacy is very much where my focus is um, at present uh, and finally just a, a quick share again of a folio space and i think this will be increasingly important for uh, the next generations coming along wherever you're acquiring your learning pick up your open badge and i love the way that um, mahara makes it very easy to display your open badges and put them together we encourage our students when they do virtual exchange to pick up their virtual exchange badge and to include that in their e-portfolio the fact that your learning uh, can, again is portable and can your open badge use can capture a wider learning experience uh, i'm very interested in the work that's being done by the open recognition alliance which again i'll pop that in a as a, another link sorry sam will providing lots and lots of links in here to a follow-up if people are interested um, and I'm just going to finally provide you as well with the competency framework that we developed for the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange project. So there's a link here that shows you um, how we recognize the skills that students acquire through intercultural collaborative learning in um, virtual exchange. Uh, and virtual exchange very much is an interdisciplinary activity. It's not just about language learning. Um, so I hope uh, you found some interesting examples there and uh, I very much welcome continued um, interaction around uh, certainly a pedagogy of e-portfolios. Um, I think sometimes it's quite a sell uh, for people because they, in, in COVID times I've been rather depressed that our focus has all been on proctoring and um, distance uh, assessment that doesn't think about the process of learning. It's really, really important that we make students aware of their learning processes. That's probably the most useful uh, skill that we can ever help them to develop. Um, so I think I'll finish at that point and thank you very much for your attention. I'll just pop my screen back on and I'll come back to your questions. Thank you very, very much. That was wonderful. And, you know, on the subject of badges, I've just put in there that you can claim a badge for today. So all those that have attended, you can find a link to claim your um, Mahara attending badge. Um, yeah, so there's lots of discussion going on. Oh, lots of thanks as well. Um, I, I'll give you a minute to read some of the comments and I'll let you respond. Yes, I just loads to... coming. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I'm, I'm glad to see people have, have been thinking about folio spaces. I think, uh, you know, it, it, you know, I'm sure there are other, other 
other products exist out there. Um, but it's uh, it's really useful to know that you can take things with you. And uh, I think the wonderful thing about Mahara as well, using Mahara in terms of skills development, is it provides a really nice way of both model modeling, scaffolding skills development. It gives students time to think about ownership of things like images they upload, uh, about Creative Commons licensing. My, my um, uh, uh, final year students who do the developing teaching and languages student had, had never heard of this and hadn't thought about issues around into um, about IP online um, and also very important and I've seen this in other presentations it helps students focus on their audience awareness so when they're pulling um, together to show to a particular audience they make carefully considered decisions about what they put where um, and permissions and sharing all, all excellent skill sets um, that we need if we're going to be effective um, and communicate effectively online. And Gordon has asked, her badge. Yep. So Gordon has asked, um, what's your top tip for getting students to engage in critical reflective activity? I, th I, I think I would hesitate to re recommend a top tip but I go along with the modeling and scaffolding process. Um, so, you know, actually putting what I do within my teaching is put examples before students of, you know, I could do this this way, I could do it this way, I could do it that way, put them into groups and discuss which do you think is better, what works and why, what's important to you, what matters. Um, and uh, a little bit of research, let's look into this company and that company and how they deal with different things. I, I'm very much drawn to Mahara because of the ethical basis of how Mahara is designed and implemented. And you know, I feel the same about open source in general, really. Um, but that's not to say open source equals wonderful, because it doesn't. You have to be critical about these things. You have to engage in a bit more depth than that. So I haven't got an easy answer, but I think that's that's teaching for you. There, there isn't an easy answer. <laughs> Just your way of doing things. Yeah, it's fi finding finding things that actually um, examples that motivate students to dig a bit deeper. I think most of us have sort of well-developed critical skills um, we just tend to perhaps put them on the back burner when we're thinking more intrinsically about how do I pass this module. Um, um, so uh, extrinsically rather, we, you need that intrinsic motivation to think about it. Okay. Well, Louise, it's great, it's good to know, you. Uh, it's great to see people doing more around Creative Commons with students and, and ownership. I think taking, if we, you know, if we're going to understand how the internet works, we need to become more creators and less consumers. I see see it already, and it's kind of encouraged within the VLE mentality that you are just a consumer. You log into the course, you get what you need. That that's not enough. Which is why I talk about the complementarity of, of these two um, tools of Moodle and Mahara together. Um, you do need to, exactly. You do need scaffolding um, to trigger reflection and, and encouragement to reflect. But as I, as I showed you in um, in Joe's examples, sometimes what comes out of that process way exceeds <laughs> your expectations. So it's really worth doing. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to now wrap up because we've got ten minutes before the next section. 